I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose, a terrific group in the gallery today joined and joining I see, and we'll have a few more in the next two, three, four minutes. I think this is a, uh, a conversation which is a privilege. Uh, I know I speak for all of you, certainly speak for myself. President Biden's been in Ukraine. President Biden is in Warsaw, I think speaking as we speak. In my view, uh, in a nutshell, this is a conversation about how to help Ukraine win the war and what a group. Let me mention at the top that this is co-hosted with AEI's podcast, Eastern Front. Tizal Donnelly is with us, Dalla Barohach is with us, and of course, Yulia Shoja, all three co-hosts. And I think in due course, we'll hear in the question round from you, Tizal, and you, Dalla what a tremendous group with General Hodges and Admiral Fogo and General Breedloff joining in progress today. We have three individuals of service, of tremendous operational knowledge and experience. And I would add to that true vision and strategic sense. I can't think of a better three individuals to help us understand the events of the day, but more to the point, going forward and what's to be done. Thank you all for your time. And Yulia Zhoja of the Eastern Front podcast of AEI and of Georgetown University and George Washington University. Yulia, you initiated this program. You put it together and you're the moderator today. So the floor is yours. Just one last word for me. We'll go 30 minutes or so with Yulia and our three distinguished guests in conversation. Yulia? Over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thanks to you and to American Purpose for hosting us. Um, and uh, of course, a big thank you to our panelists um, today um, for agreeing to talk to um, on this panel. Um, I know they are friends, um, but I haven't seen them. And this is how um, we had the idea in the first place. I haven't seen them uh, on the same um, platform talking about um, this war. And uh, and so I'm thrilled um, that we get to, um, uh, to host them today. Uh, I'm gonna keep um, the, my remarks and my questions very brief because I want to um, make this as interactive as possible and give as many um, participants the chance, thank you for joining us, um, to um, weigh in with their questions and um, brief comments in the second half um, of this hour. Um, and um, just to frame um, the conversation today, um, we are due to talk about the first year um, of the full-scale Russian invasion on Ukraine and about what um, we should be expecting um, from the next year or so. Um, but before we get into the uh, bits and pieces, the um, um, the details of the last um, year. And again, we have here um, what one obviously one of the ideas behind um, this panel was to have um, air, uh, navy, and um, and land forces um, joining together to um, uh, to assess the situation. And um, all three, um, Admiral Fogo, General Breedlove, and General Hodges, have been, as you all know, working closely um, on Ukraine with Ukraine um, for the last few years. Before we get into the bits and pieces of the last year, I want to start this conversation taking a few steps back, if I may, with you, Admiral Foco, um, over the last few years, and to start from the maritime perspective to ask you how we got here. Um, how did we, from the maritime perspective, um, allow forward naval presence um, in the Black Sea to deteriorate to the point that Russia has not just um, illegally annexed and dom uh, illegally annexed Crimea and dominated the Black Sea, transforming it in the famous words of President Erdogan into um, a Russian lake um, or almost a Russian lake, but it has also used um, uh, the Black Sea for years as power projection further south um, into Syria. Now, over the last year, 
that has been um, reversing in a trend um, with uh, Russia reallocating some of its forces from Syria um, back into, um, into the Ukraine battlefield. But from the Western perspective and from your perspective, Admiral Fogo, how did we get here um, from the point of view of maritime security? Thank you very much, Yulia, <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation to participate in uh, American Purposes. Jeff, uh, thanks for a great introduction, and also uh, with your staff, Caroline Stewart, for doing a super job with uh, connectivity today. So, Yulia, you ask a tough question. I mean, this uh, has been uh, portrayed as primarily a land campaign since the kickoff on 24 February. Uh, in three days, it'll be an anniversary, and boy, what a what a final week here uh, before that anniversary with the president's visit uh, to uh, Ukraine, to Kiev, and now in Warsaw, and the vice president to Munich Security Conference. But uh, I've written extensively and spoken extensively about how we got here with uh, pretty much no NATO presence, no U.S. presence in the Black Sea. And uh, that's extremely disturbing to me as a naval officer. We've seen good things happen on the ground, and we've seen some incremental advances on the ground. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But if you go back to uh, 2007, to the Munich Security Conference, when President Putin uh, spoke about the encirclement of Russia, uh, frankly, in my opinion, uh, paranoia, paranoia, because the alliance does not offensively take other people's territory the way Russia is trying to do in Ukraine, we defend. Uh, the territory and the contiguous borders of our allies and partners. And so that kind of started it off. And then the Russians uh, did a soft pullout and a full pullout of the Conventional Forces Europe Treaty, which is transparency for exercises. You never know when 300,000 troops on your border who claim to be doing an exercise are going to invade. And that happened last 24 uh, February and 22. And then the invasion of Georgia. And everybody was really concerned about that. Uh, so concerned that uh, the U.S. and NATO pushed for a reset with Russia, the famous picture of Hillary Clinton and Sergei Lavrov, who outlasted probably five or six uh, sex states here in this country. That didn't last for long, but I'll tell you, during the time we were doing a Russia work plan with Russia, 365 days a year, personnel exchanges, band exchanges, you know, marching in parades, work colleges, and also a chaplain corps, if you can imagine. The Russians were part of Baltops up until 2013. Now, I commanded in 15 and 16, and they were on the other side of the iron at that time because they'd gone to the dark side after um, the invasion of Crimea. Um, and so uh, then they started to focus on the Black Sea. They built the Kerch Bridge in 2016 with the purpose of strangulating commercial uh, traffic into Mariupol and other ports and dominating in the Sea of Azov. At the time, I said, hey, that's a protocol that they could export to the Black Sea, and they certainly did. To push back against that, uh, we had the Ukrainian CNO in my headquarters in Naples at the end of 2018. He announced uh, his intention to uh, put the mosquito fleet to sea. You remember the incident that took place in 2019 when those three ships tried to pass through the Kerch Bridge were hit by uh, an FSB patrol craft, fired upon, rammed, uh, holes in the hull, 27 sailors put in a prison in Moscow, uh, much uh, uh, to the chagrin of the West and also a violation of the Geneva Convention. They came back about two years later on a prisoner exchange, but completely unsat. So one of my jobs after 2014 was help rearm the uh, Ukrainian Navy. They lost 85% of it in Sevastopol when the Russians took uh, Crimea and they had one ship, Hamid Sagadashny, which a few months ago, President Zelensky ordered scuttled in the Mykolaiv shipyard. He didn't want to fall in the hands of the Russians. Uh, we were transferring excess defense articles, island-class Coast Guard cutters to Ukraine. They were delivered by my chief of staff to Odessa. The problem was that these ships uh, had their weaponry stripped. Uh, there was no deck on, on the forward deck. It was just a metal plate. And the Ukrainians had the responsibility of buying their own weapon systems. If you think about it, we should have been arming Ukraine in 2014 after the illegal annexation of Crimea. And we did. That was a mistake. We're catching up for it now. Uh, I believe in deterrence, not a punishment strategy. And I think we got locked into a punishment strategy. We're doing a pretty good job. I mean, you saw the president uh, in his remarks, $100 billion in aid to Ukraine. Uh, but it could have come sooner in 2014. Hence, the boiling frog scenario. Now, what do we do about it? We've got to get back in and establish a presence in the Black Sea. We had three U.S. commissioned ships in the Black Sea in December 2021, the command ship of Sixth Fleet, my favorite ship in the Navy, USS Mount Whitney, and two Burke-class destroyers, Porter and USS Burke. 
We pulled them out in December of 21 so as not to exacerbate the Russians and cause an invasion. Well, guess what? They did anyway. So my thesis is we never should have left. And uh, we need a strategy for the Black Sea. We've got to reestablish presence. I think I've got some suggestions for how to do that. And uh, we can talk about that later in the podcast and also talk about some of the interesting things that are happening here in Washington with the uh, Shaheen Romney, which uh, purposefully addresses Black Sea strategy. So I'll stop there and back to you and my shipmate, uh, General Hodges. Um, let me follow up on that. Um, as a matter of fact, as Biden is speaking in Warsaw, timely, he seemed to have coordinated his schedule with ours. Um, um, Senator Shaheen is um, speaking in um, Romania about um, exactly that strategy. But before we get to that, um, let me ask you, how do we fix this in terms of military maritime presence in the Black Sea. We know that, um, and a lot of the conversations are about Turkey, um, Turkey invoking Montreux, um, the Montreux Convention interpreting it in a certain way, but we also know that if we're looking over the last few years in the very um, tight limits that um, the Turks are allowing as foreign presence, um, the United States and um, other um, uh, NATO allies have not been taking um, advantage of the limited presence that they have um, in terms of days, hours, that they can be um, present in the Black Sea. Um, so how do we go about, in, in your understanding, how do we go about Turkey and, and what should we be thinking about investing in um, to be able to allow um, more of a military presence of the United States, particularly in the Black Sea region as deterrence? Yulia, great question. And if you look at what's happened in the Army, and I'm sure Ben will talk about this, you know, we started off the defense of Ukraine with the shipment of things like javelins, stingers. Uh, then we had 155 uh, millimeter artillery shells of all different varieties and all different nations and artillery, and then HIMARS, which turned to be a, uh, uh, you know, a turning point in the campaign, a very lethal and a very accurate weapon that was used inside the borders of Ukraine to push the Russians back, and it worked. So if you take that uh, approach of incrementalism, uh, we don't have to go charging back into the Black Sea because we lack presence there now, like the British did in the Dardanelles in World War I, the precursor to uh, Gallipoli, as the Commonwealth would say, or Chanakali, as the Turks would say. Uh, my suggestion is that we do things uh, deliberately. So I've I've talked with uh, Romanians about this, and I've talked with Americans and uh, NATO personnel about this. You know, I think we have to start with uh, what are the problems there? The problem is no presence. Uh, certainly the Romanians and Bulgarians are NATO nations, but I think they struggle with going out to sea and facing up against uh, the Russian Black Sea fleet uh, because their respective fleets are older and uh, require uh, readiness, maintenance, and modernization. Mines are a problem. Let's focus on that. Let's, I don't think anybody can argue that mines are a, a universal threat to everybody, including the Russians. So why wouldn't we try to get back in there with the Standing NATO Mine Countermeasures Group, SNMCG, and do some mine sweeping? You know, I talked to the Romanian CNO a couple of months ago, Mihail Panet. He was in uh, Norfolk, I was there for a conference. He told me the story about 300 ships off the coast of Constanta. They're sitting there waiting for transit passage through the Bosphorus as we work out this deal on uh, Russia's hunger blockade in Istanbul. Uh, somebody spotted a mine in the vicinity of those ships. That was dangerous to civilian mariners. So he dispatched one of his Romanian minesweepers. It went out. Uh, by the time it got there, weather and uh, darkness had fallen. They hit the mine, blew the ship up. Thankfully, nobody killed. Made it back into port, but that ship is out of commission. And they've had another incident like that. So my question to both uh, Admiral Panet and to General Petrescu, who was here in my center in this headquarters a few months ago, is, are you getting any help from NATO? And the answer was, no, not really. Uh, getting any unmanned assistance, because we have all these tools that I've seen in ball tops that you can throw over the side of a rigid hold inflatable boat that can do mine hunting and uh, mine countermeasures. And the answer was, again, no. So I think start incrementally, work with the Turks, get back in there. And I can't imagine that the Russians would have a problem with uh, what is uh, nothing other than a humanitarian mission to sweep mines and get them out of the uh, uh, the sea lanes so that ships can pass 
uh, without danger of actually being hit. That would be a way to start it and then move up into forward naval presence along the lines of what we had before the war began on February 24, 2022. Thank you, Admiral Fogo. And let me um, bridge this um, and turn to um, General Hodges and ask you about resources, um, both on the NATO side and um, and on the um, Ukrainian side. Um, you've been um, training, overseeing the training for years um, of um, Ukraine after 2014. Um, you're looking closely um, from Germany, just a few hundred kilometers away from, um, from the um, the battlefield, um, you're looking closely at um, how this war has been progressing. And overall, we basically see with, you know, I don't, I, I'm not even counting anymore. We're at the 11th, 12th package of um, military aid from the United States um, to Ukraine um, that then is being tagged along by other allies. But Ukraine is still asking for more. They've been asking for more for a long time. And it seems um, that we are trickling in without really feeding what we're trickling in into a strategy of winning. So can you talk to us about that? So the, the incremental approach of the administration and of our other allies um, is, uh, is obviously too slow. I mean, there's a lot that's been provided, but the quantity actually means nothing. What 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 is most important is what are the capabilities that Ukraine needs? Uh, what is the effect that we need to achieve? So, if you give a million rounds of artillery ammunition, but the requirement was for two million, then a million is not so good. So, uh, I think what we have got to do is is change the narrative around to um, what what is our end state. And this is still, I, you know, I was at the Munich Security Conference this past weekend, uh, lots of intense, rich discussions, probably one of the best Munich Security Conferences I've ever attended. But still, I left there wondering what is our end state? You know, when the, when the vice president says, uh, we're, we will stick, we're in it for as long as it takes without saying what it is. And um, so until the administration can articulate what our strategic objective is, then we will forever be wrestling around with, you know, M1 tanks or F-16s or ATACMs, you know, and focusing on systems instead of capabilities that lead to victory. Now, I happen to believe that Ukraine can and should win this war this year, and specifically uh, Crimea, which is the decisive part of this war, not Donbass, Crimea could be liberated by the end of this summer if and this is a gigantic if, if we, the West, led by the United States, Germany, France, and UK, decided that we wanted Ukraine to win this year. I mean, we're the only ones holding it up, not the Russians. It's us. Um, but I think that, honestly, I think in a way we're almost scared of, of Ukraine winning, of defeat, totally defeating Russia. And obviously there are other people that will have a different view or that also are concerned about this uh, for for a variety of reasons. But if we said we want Ukraine to win this year, and the key is the liberation of Crimea, which could happen by the end of the summer, then what do you need to do that? You need long-range precision weapons that could isolate the Crimean Peninsula by making sure the Russians never rebuild the Kerch Bridge and that uh, the so-called land bridge that connects Crimea through Melitopol, Mariupol, back to Rostov, that it is severed starting with long-range precision weapons, and then this uh, armored uh, armored force that the Ukrainians are building that I anticipate will launch somewhere around June. Once that all happens, then, then this could happen very fast. But if we're not, if we're not committed to winning, and, and despite all the incredible good things our administration has done, they still can't bring themselves to say, we want Ukraine to win, then we're going to continue to be incremental in our approach. Now, what's also missing, because we have been incremental and we haven't made the commitment to win, um, there's a lot of hand-wringing going on about how much ammunition is being consumed. Uh, and there's talk about, you know, how do we help Ukrainians not shoot so much ammunition? 
which is kind of bizarre since they're the ones that are fighting for their survival. Um, and instead, I haven't seen too many checks being written to actually increase, increase production. There's lots of talk about the need for our defense industry to be able to do more, but these are not charities. I mean, the Department of Defense has to write a check to all whoever it is so that they can actually, with a contract, um, expand their, uh, you know, get more employees so that they can go more shifts uh, and also so that they can, those companies can pay their suppliers for the things that are needed to make more um, uh, rock, Gimler's rockets or uh, artillery ammunition or javelin or all the different things that are needed. So this, we don't have the right sense of urgency, I would say. Now, Russia's much ballyhooed uh, offensive uh, we've been hearing all about that was going to start. I think actually it has already started uh, with a bit of a whimper. Uh, all it seems that they can actually do is increase the number of poorly led, poorly trained, poorly equipped conscripts, push them into the meat grinder that already exists along a broad front. And I honestly uh, don't see them being able to sustain this beyond uh, April or probably May. So in other words, I think their offensive culminates by May. And, you know, from Clausewitz, the culmination point is when the attacker loses the impetus due to uh, casualties or logistics or lost will or increasing strength of the defender. And I think that's what we're going to be seeing around May. And I think the Ukrainian general staff sees that. They see that they're able to hold back Russian forces around Bakhmut for months, months. And the Ukrainians are using primarily Territorial Defense Force, National Guard forces, uh, not their first line armored formations, because I think they're saving these armored formations, training, building them up, preparing them for when it's time to launch uh, a counter strike. Again, I think in June in a southeasterly direction to begin the isolation of Crimea. So this is, uh, and this would be my last point that the um, the Ukrainian general staff has shown great discipline, uh, operational security. Uh, we know more about the Russians than we do about what the Ukrainians are doing, uh, which is as it should be. And um, I think that they have nerves of steel to, to resist the temptation to push every new thing into this terrible fight that's happening around Bakhmut. Uh, but, but they recognize the need to use their forces around Bakhmut in what we would call economy of force so that they can build up real capability for the main effort, which will come later in a southeasterly direction, probably towards uh, between Melitopol, Mariupol and that area, isolate Crimea and then bring up the precision capability uh, necessary to make the Crimean Peninsula uninhabitable, untenable, That's, that will be the key. Thank you, um, General Hodges. I haven't mentioned because we were hoping that he can join us through the process. Um, General Breedlov has been um, held up um, by um, a parallel conflict last minute. So we're still waiting on him to join. Um, and while we do that, um, let me ask um, you, General um, Hodges, um, a quick follow-up question, and then perhaps I can go back to Admiral Fogo. Um, let me paint the other picture. Um, you've spoken very eloquently um, to uh, uh, to the fact that with um, a clear vision and clear aims, we can finish this sooner rather than later. Um, but we are now into one year, partially also because of hesitation, partially political hesitation and partially, of course, strategic calculations, but partially also what you spoke to, and that is, which is coming um, in an unclear manner through media all the time, that we have shortcomings when it comes to ammunition. It was Soviet ammunition um, that the Ukrainians needed, including for the tanks, hence we moved to the 
uh, Cold War time Western um, capabilities. Um, we have we have an increased production um, as much as we would have needed to um, in um, both the United States and in Germany. Um, and we've seen the foreign minister um, of Germany at the Munich Security Conference meeting um, or bringing together um, the uh, bigger producers um, from the German market um, with the Ukrainians trying to speed that process up. So is it a matter of um, just political will or is it also a matter of resources because we keep thinking um, or we keep saying that time is actually on Putin's side because we are dragging this out and he's waiting for us to get tired um, to abandon Ukraine and to move on to the next um, topic the next hot conflict so how do you assess the risks if we keep the same pace um, as we have through the last year into the next year, where are we then in one year? Do the Ukrainians have any chance then to, to um, destroy the land bridge, to take back Crimea, or will we be um, with uh, enormous human losses in uh, one year where we are now? Julia, that was about 12 questions uh, in one sentence. Look, uh, we need to get a sense of urgency. It's up to us to get this done this year. And for whatever reason, I, I think part of it, too many people in the administration and in other countries are um, concerned about a nuclear escalation that's not going to happen. We have been deterring ourselves for a year. There were A year ago, people were wringing their hands that if we gave Stinger to the Ukrainians and they shot down a Russian helicopter with an American-made Stinger, the Russians would escalate. And so we do this. We climb the stairs every month. There's something new and the Russians can't do anything about it. Of course, they have thousands of nuclear weapons, and of course, they don't care how many innocent people are killed, but I think that they uh, believe President Biden when he said catastrophic consequences if they use a nuclear weapon, and there's no battlefield advantage for them. They have strategic nuclear weapons, and of course, today, President Putin announced that they're suspending their participation to start. Uh, what, a, what a shocking uh, announcement this is. Um, the uh, the fact is, they're not going to use a strategic weapon against the United States. That's what those are designed for. So they have tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons were invented during the Cold War to blow a gap in NATO defenses. And then they had forces that were uh, trained and properly equipped mobile forces that could operate in a contaminated environment, a radioactive environment, to exploit that gap that they blew in our defenses. Those forces don't exist anymore. There is no mobile force prepared to operate in a radioactive environment to exploit a tactical nuclear weapon. So there's zero positive upside for them. No advantage. Their nuclear weapons only work if they don't use them. As soon as they use them, then it's all over. And I think they know that. And that's why we have got to stop um, deterring ourselves uh, and limiting what we're doing and get serious about this. 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, I never heard any president say we're going to win. And, and you see how this turned out. So we have got to we have got to get clarity on the objective, and then you'll get the necessary speed and sense of urgency. Thank you, General Hodges. Turning to you, General Rutloff, I'm glad that you um you could join us and you heard the last part of our um, conversation about war aims. And I know um you feel very strongly about some of these things. So let me just give you the floor before we open up for questions. I see they're already piling in. Um, let me just give you the floor and ask you. Where are we in terms of war aims in your understanding? I know you've been um, briefing the administration throughout um, the past year on exactly that. Um, and also, um, if you can give us just a very um, brief assessment um, from the perspective, because you're completing the picture, of air power. Um, where are we on that? We're, right now, President Biden is speaking um, in Warsaw um, as we're speaking, while um, the Ukraine Ukrainian refugees and uh, uh, in solidarity, the Poles are asking for F-16s for Ukraine in public places. So, General Breedlove, the floor is yours. Well, first, let me profusely apologize for being late. Um, and let me say that I couldn't be more happy to be on this panel. All the faces, uh, those asking the questions are heroes of mine. And and particularly uh, serving with uh, Ben and Jamie in the past. I just really appreciate 
being in such good company. Let me pile on something that Ben just said and you all were talking about as I joined. Um, and yes, uh, Putin is beginning to have some small, very small incremental gains in some parts of the battlefield, but let's just look at the big picture. He suffered two strategic defeats in the North. He's on the verge of an operational defeat in my mind down in the South. And um, uh, it's clear to me that in the grand scheme of things, Mr. Putin's army and his military is failing him. But what is working for him? His war of words, his war of intimidation, his ability to deter the West is working extremely good. And I think this is what Ben was talking to at the end. Um, we are withholding things in the West and we are slow leaking things to Ukraine in the West because we are deterred. And uh, Mr. Putin understands this. Every time he gives a speech, every time one of his major uh, leaders give a speech, there's always a nuclear component. He wants to keep the West worried about nukes. On a little less frequent basis, but still a pretty frequent basis, his second line of deterrence is to continue to threaten Armageddon and a war, and Western soldiers, particularly American soldiers, are gonna die on this battlefield if it keeps going forward. So I think along the lines of what Ben was saying, and he may or may not agree with me, I think that Mr. Putin understands that this, this intimidation and getting at the center of gravity in America, meaning the political division and the device, divisiveness on things like this, this is what Mr. Putin is continuing to put the pressure on. And we, we, in my opinion, in the West need to be big enough to recognize this in the context of the factual sort of things been discussed. And I think we need to move out, which brings me to my second um, point. And I've probably spoken 11 times in the last seven days. I've just come back from the road. And people ask me, what's the most important thing we need to give Ukraine? And I surprise them all because I think the most important thing we need to give Ukraine right now is a clear policy. If we simply said that we're going to support them to win, we keep saying this, we're going to be with them for as long as it takes. Well, the immediate follow-on question is, for as long as it takes to do what? How do we measure what we need to give them if we don't have a sight picture for where we need to end up? And right now, I think that we have taken the path of ambiguity here to try to facilitate an earlier trip to the negotiating table. And I find that very disappointing. Um, I think the most important thing that we could give Ukraine that right now has nothing to do with metal or tritinol. It has everything to do with America saying, we're gonna support Ukraine to regain all its territorial integrity. Remember the Budapest memorandum we pledged to keep their sovereignty and to protect their territorial integrity. Let's just say that we're going to re remain and give them what we promised them in the Budapest Memorandum. I know it wasn't a treaty. I, I remember all the discussions about why we sort of war, wrote that the, that agreement in a in a in my words Weasley word kind of way. Uh, but we can still stand to our promise about uh, their integrity and their sovereignty. How can you be a sovereign nation if Russia owns 24 to 25 percent? of your countryside, your two biggest ports, and can hold your third biggest port under fire from Crimea. I, and then, uh, uh, sorry, I'm running off at the mouth, but just to talk a few minutes about the air. What worries me first and foremost about the air campaign in, in uh, Ukraine is has more to do with America than any, anywhere else. We're learning some very bad lessons. There are people out there saying that air power is no longer important. Look, Russia has been unable to establish air power in Ukraine. And Ukraine, a fabulous job done with a tiny, old, far less capable air force, 
but air power has not yet had an effect on this battlefield. Drones and long range strike weapons fired from airplanes and things, yes, they're having an effect. But the traditional ability to gain and maintain air superiority over the battlefield to then empower air power to eliminate the lines on the battlefield, which we see growing all the time now, this linear warfare, air power, and oh, by the way, maneuver, armored maneuver, eliminate these lines. And we are yet to give Ukraine the capability to change the shape of the battlefield by eliminating lines. And so uh, I think I'll get off the stage with that. Again, I'm sorry for having arrived late and I really look forward to the questions. Thank you, um, General Breedlove. Um, even though you haven't heard um, the first part, I believe there's perfect sync here <laughs> between the three arms of the armed forces. Um, I, um, taking the moderator's prerogative, um, and because this is co-hosted by um, our podcast, to give um, uh, give the floor first to Giselle and Dadebor um, if they have questions for either of our panelists. Giselle? I don't have so much of a question, although I really appreciated the, the presentation. I think I'd, I'd be interested at, at some juncture from hearing from Admiral Fogo about how to put together um, a, a sufficient Ukrainian Navy to help control the Black Sea. It seems to me that we have some LCS that we're trying to ditch that could be ideal for, you know, assuming that the ships themselves work. Uh, but also, Europe is crawling with corvettes and things like that that could be quite useful. But aside from that technical question, here's something sort of for all three of our guests. Um, I, I wonder if it's worth redefining what the end state is. Victory for Ukraine, uh, Ukraine whole and free, that's, yeah. that is the near-term goal, absolutely. But it seems to me that there's a longer term goal that never gets spoken about, and that's uh, what to do after that. How? Because this is really a seems to me a piece of a larger effort towards uh, the f future containment uh, and deterrence uh, of Russian aggression. Um, and I wonder too, just politically, whether it wouldn't be better to reason backward from that kind of, uh, you know, 1947 type vision of what the project is uh, that would tell us that um, the faster we get to a stable uh, line of deterrence or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, might uh, help get past this incrementalism that all three of you have described. Admiral Fogo, can we turn to you first? You sort of had two already questions piled up. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Giselle. On the question of what can we do for the Ukrainian Navy. So prior to the uh, conflict, we were trying to rearm and rebuild the Ukrainian Navy. Again, uh, a little too little and too late. And uh, we should have provided them with armed warships and capable warships immediately uh, after 2014, the illegal annexation of Crimea. I don't think anybody would have blamed us or the West for that, NATO or the United States. And that would have given Ukraine a better fighting chance in the seas uh, contiguous with their own territory uh, to push the Russians back. We haven't done that. And there's now, um, I hate to say it, but uh, virtual presence equals virtual absence in the Black Sea. Uh, Yulia started off with uh, reference to a comment <clears throat> the Turks had made about now uh, the Black Sea is a Russian lake. We've got to reverse that. We can't allow the seeding of international uh, waters uh, to solely one nation. One of the ways to start that incrementally, in consort with uh, uh, my first comments when I briefed, is to beef up the anti-access area denial capabilities that not only Ukraine have, but also mm -hmm. Bulgaria. Uh, Romania and Georgia, as well as the Turks. Uh, we've seen success on the part of the Ukrainians with two air-breathing Neptune-class cruise missiles. They were upgraded from an old Russian design. They sank the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva. And th the Russians were stunned by that. Frankly, so was the rest of the world. And uh, that 
technically speaking, shouldn't have happened because that ship had every defensive capability. So if we can link up coastal defense radars with coastal defense cruise missiles, uh, Neptune or the Naval Strike Missile, um, you know, which has originated in, in Norway and proven very effective, the Poles had them, and produce unmanned systems that all have one common network for one common operating picture, unmanned surface, unmanned subsurface, and uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles. You've seen some strikes. General Breedlove mentioned drones in uh, Sevastopol and the naval base there. You've seen uh, surface vessels and video online uh, attacking the Black Sea Fleet. And as a result, the Black Sea Fleet has moved some of its assets from Sevastopol, its high-value units, to Novorossiysk. The Russians still have six Kilo-class submarines in the Black Sea. One Ukrainian minister just this past weekend suggested that a single German U-212 submarine could turn the tide of the war. Uh, that's true as long as it's crewed with the right people, and it takes a long time to train somebody how to operate a submarine. I don't see that that's viable, and non-repairian states are not allowed to bring submarines or aircraft carriers into the Black Sea under Montreux, and that would be a political quagmire that we just couldn't get through. So beefing up A2AD, making sure that everybody's connected along the entire coast, with the exception of Russia, in the Black Sea, and pushing the Russians further back, uh, Novorossiysk, Sea of Azov, establishing a domain which is safe for transit. And then you always use unmanned systems before you put manned systems in. That's when the minesweepers, that's when the rest of NATO and the NATO uh, standing maritime groups, not the mine countermeasures group, but the combat capability. I mean, General Breedlove will tell you, he never saw 29, 30 ships signed up for SNMG during his time as SAC here, neither did I. And I was 40 years in the service. Uh, we've got more assets now than we've ever had before. Time to use them, time to get back in there. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, ask um, uh, General Breedlove and General Hodges to keep the second um, question from Giselle about the aims beyond the war um, in their um, in the back of their minds and turn um, quickly to Dalibor um, to add his question. Then I'll turn after um, uh, after those answers, I'll turn to Peter Scary, whose um, hand is up, and then I'll try to um, um, uh, push in a couple of questions at a time that I see um, uh, piling up um, uh, as written questions um, into the conversation. So Dadebor, over to you. Yulia, thank you, and thank you uh, all for, for, for a wonderful uh, panel um, thus far. Um, I want to ask a question about one of the wild cards or black swans in this world, depending on what your favorite metaphor is, um, namely a stronger, renewed Chinese involvement in the conflict. Obviously, China has been crucial in helping Russia get around the sanctions and get its oil and gas out of the country. Uh, but there have been these rumors about a more sort of explicit, more direct Chinese military assistance to Russia. And I wonder if any of you have a sense of how much of a risk that would represent in the in the war going forward. If you have any thoughts about Chinese military industrial base, about Chinese equipment and its quality and how much of a sort of difference this, this could make in the conflict, uh, quite aside from the sort of geopolitical and, and sort of you know political implications of, 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 of such a move by Beijing. Thank you. Um, General Breedlove, General Hodges, would, um, would you like to address one of these questions? Um, may I jump on the last one? Um, and then uh, Ben will probably knock it out of the park with after, if not, I have a thought. So, so uh, Dalibor, this is a great question. And it's, of course, the question of the day, because our Secretary of State has acknowledged that, that they are aware that this may be happening. I believe it is already has been happening personally, but to a limited degree. So uh, now it's coming to the fore in policy discussions. And uh, to be academically honest, we have to be concerned about this. If the industrial capacity of China begins to support Russia, this is going to be a problem. But may I now make a thought that is not often considered you can pile stuff on top of bad leadership, bad execution, and bad skills. And yes, the mass will have some ability, but I think the real limits now of the Russian military is their soldiers. 
and the leaders of their soldiers and the strategic leaders of the leaders of their soldiers. Um, they have demonstrated a lack of capability and proficiency on the battlefield that is quite demonstrative. And, uh, you know, you, you, they're throwing these human waves, of course, right now. And if you're watching uh, any of the things on Twitter, the, the actual pictures of how they're doing this, it, it, uh, I'm sure it makes Ben's few hairs on his head stand straight up. The, these are not the way discipline militaries employ. And what we know is that you can't build a leader overnight. So even if they have huge mobilizations, they're missing those junior officers. Remember, they don't have an NCO Corps like we have an NCO Corps. And, and this sort of uh, density of ability to lead, think, and fight independently is not something that Russia is demonstrating on the battlefield. So it's a long answer to say, I am concerned. And clearly, if China brings industrial mass to the problem, uh, that's going to be a problem for Ukraine. But I still want us to have a sober view of what Russia can do, because they now have structural problems in their ability to effectively act as a unit on the battlefield. Thanks for asking the question. So um, I tried to answer a couple of questions in the chat about uh, what does Ukrainian victory look like? And also uh, somebody made a comment about diminishing Republican support, which I, would, which I would challenge based on what we heard from Senator McConnell at Munich Security Conference. Um, Sakur, General Cavoli said, precision defeats mass and what, if you have enough time. And of course, what he's talking about, the only advantage that Russia has is mass infantry, as General Breedlove just described. And for mass infantry to be successful, even this poorly trained, uh, especially this poorly trained, poorly led and poorly equipped mass infantry we're seeing now, they have to have mass artillery. Mass artillery requires headquarters to direct the, the fire, ammunition, which we will find in piles along roads, and then transportation or transportation network to get it there. Uh, and so, of course, the Ukrainians were using the first iteration of HIMARS to target all three of those things to great effect, but that's limited to 90 kilometers. So the Russians moved out beyond the 90 kilometers. So the priority for capability that they need, the Ukrainians, is precision that can reach further to hit headquarters, ammunition, and transportation. That's how you neutralize the only advantage that Russia has. I think that we're going to see the collapse of the Russian uh, forces, you know, before the end of this summer. Um, what 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 uh, Clausewitz called the culminating point, due to losses, due to lack of will, uh, due to resources, they're struggling with uh, their own ammunition problems right now. They're having to import drones from Iran, Russia. I mean, what does that tell you about the state of of, of Russia's economy and their and their defense industry? right now. Uh, I take great hope from the fact that you've got all the Russian warlords hate each other, and they are, there is so much animosity between Shoigu, Prigozhin, Kadyrov. You don't see too many videos of dead Chechens. He's keeping them out of the fight. Um, the Ukrainians call them the TikTok army because there's a lot of videos of them on parade, but they don't actually do anything. And so I think Kadyrov is waiting for opportunity either for a third Chechen war or maybe he sees himself as the uh, uh, the savior. Prigozhin constantly whining, complaining about not getting enough support from the general staff. Of course he's not, because he doesn't take orders from them. And actually, I think many of them would rather see him fail than see Russia succeed. And so because of this incoherent command structure, after nine years, they still have not figured out how to organize what we almost take for granted, a co coherent joint integrated command structure, like General Breedlove used to lead, um, and therefore they also don't have a coherent plan. So this makes Ukraine's problem more manageable. Peter, um, over to you. Yes, thank you, Yulia. Um, I'm uh, uh, obviously impressed by the presentations of our three uh, former military guests. The question that immediately comes to mind is, 
Is it their assessment that their colleagues who are still in service, generally speaking, share their assessment of the military situation? Um, I'm thinking maybe particularly of what General Hodges had to say about the inutility of tactical nukes for the reasons he explained. But more generally, is it their sense that the their colleagues in service are, are roughly in agreement with their with their perspective, and that the real problem here is the is 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 politics of the administration and the and the uh, inability of the Biden administration to decide what the hell it wants to do politically? Admiral Fogo, do you want to go first? I saw you unmuted yourself. Sure. Hey, Peter, thanks for the question. Uh, I don't think there's a naval officer worth his salt that wants to cede sea space to an adversary or to an enemy. And I think that, uh, you know, I won't speak directly for my colleagues that remain on active duty. Uh, many of COCOMs are my friends. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, if it were me sitting in the seat in Naples today, I would want to figure out every possible way uh, to get back into the Black Sea. The problem was back in December of 2021 when we pulled those three capital ships out. So we had the two Burke class destroyers and the command ship USS Mount Whitney. It's like a, a non combatant evacuation operation from an embassy. Many ambassadors, many of my friends here in Washington tell me once you shutter an American embassy in a country someplace, it's very, very difficult to get back in. Once we left the Black Sea in December 2021, it's going to make it very difficult for us to get back in. It established a new normal, which is our absence. Had we maintained our presence, and as I said, uh, Putin attacked anyway, we didn't want to exacerbate him, but he did it anyway, uh, we would still have had some naval presence in the southern approaches to the Bosphorus and inside the Black Sea. That's not to say we'd be stupid and go charging up to the north and pick a fight with the Russians, but we would have established a sea space that we could have controlled and maintained, particularly sea lines of communication that are being used for those merchant ships that are carrying grain for the good guys, Ukraine, and also for the bad guys, uh, Russia. And Russia has gotten a lot of gains out of that. Let me piggyback real quick on the last question and just say something about China. My question, sitting in a, a seat as a strategist, is what's in it for China? Uh, so why would, you know, the administration made it very clear. They must have information that uh, China was thinking about uh, lethal aid to Ukraine up until this time it's been non-lethal aid. So what is the, uh, the calculus in Xi Jinping or any of his advisors' minds uh, to do this? Because Xi certainly does not want to come down on the wrong side of history. He's got too much at stake for his country and for his economy and for his growth weight, which really isn't doing as well as it has in past years. He's getting Russian oil and gas. He's getting grain and barley to feed his people. That's a significant concern. What other things is he getting? Is he getting uh, rare earth metals, semi-precious metals? Uh, is he getting uranium? Is he getting uh, iron ore to help them build uh, a very impressive Navy? Uh, it's not the fellowship and the camaraderie with the Russians. Russia is a weak country compared to China and its massive economy. What are the ramifications if they do provide lethal aid? I think Secretary Blinken made it very clear that there would be consequences uh, to the point of a red line. And so what does that mean for China? Does that mean economic sanctions to slow them down? Will they become an international pariah if they provide lethal aid? Will that make it more difficult to assimilate Taiwan either peacefully or by force? I think yes to those latter questions. And I think that the Chinese will think twice about making uh, any overtures on lethal aid uh, to Russia in the near future. And if they do, that's just plain dumb. Thanks for the opportunity to add something there. Thank you. Uh, we only have very few minutes left. So what I'm going to try to do is to um, compile a couple of the questions that we've gotten and turn to um, each one of you um, in, in uh, one minute max um, uh, to tell us what you're expecting basically from the next few months. Um, and um, I see that a lot of the questions are um, around Russia, that we've overestimated Russia, but what are then the chances 
chances that they are likely to adapt and improve um, during 2023. We know now from what you've um, told us that a lot depends, of course, on our um, capacity to push back, um, but nevertheless, focusing on um, Russia's capacity to adapt, how likely are they to, um, to improve um, during 2023 based on um, Greg Craig's question? And also, um, we've seen Putin now suspending um, the INF, uh, the New START Treaty, sorry, um, uh, today. How significant is that in um, also bilateral relations and um, generally across the transatlantic security space? So um, I'm going to turn to um, Ben Hodges first, um, give him um, the floor for a minute, um, turn then to General Breedlove um, and to Admiral Foco and wrap this up. So uh, first, what's going to happen this year? Crimea should be liberated. It's decisive. Ukraine will never be safe or secure, never able to rebuild its economy as long as Russia occupies Crimea. And for sure, there will be no Marshall Plan because nobody will invest anything in Russia unless there is a strong, an ironclad secure, I'm sorry, in Ukraine, unless there is an ironclad security guarantee. You can't have that as long as Russia continues to occupy Crimea. Second to the second part, can Russia learn and improve? You know, these guys are very intelligent, but they have zero potential for learning in this particular situation. Because to learn, you have to have a, a culture of self critical self-reflection. And I don't think you make the rank of corporal in the Russian army by admitting a mistake or taking big risks. And so without being able to do that, without being able to publicly say, okay, I've screwed this up or this ain't working, we need to change it. I see very little potential for them to make any significant changes, certainly this year. Thank you. General Breedlaw. I'm in violent agreement with everything Ben just said. I would like to add, I think that we have to be academically honest. A well-led Russia could still be a huge problem. But I go back to my original remarks. You're asking, what do I think is the potential? I see all the issues that Ben identified in an earlier remark uh, amongst the strategic leadership in Russia. I see no real capability emerging from the strategic leadership of Russia. And I think what we're going to see is a lot more of the same attrition-based warfare. And if, if the West provides the, the precision and the density and the, the capabilities of more range to uh, Ukraine, they will do very well proceeding along the path that Ben described. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Fogo, last word to you. <laughs> Thanks, Yulia. I think the bottom line here is uh, what can we do to defeat uh, Russia in this war in Ukraine? Um, you know, do we have a strategy? And what is the strategy? You know, I wrote one back in 2018 with the help of the Center for Naval Analysis, a brilliant field rep. I went back and reread it last week before this podcast. Uh, it's classified, so I won't go into the details. Bottom line up front, uh, maintain a presence in the Black Sea, which we're not doing right now. I also had an opportunity to uh, help Senator Shaheen's uh, professional staffers with her bill and fed some information in uh, in the market. It's out there online. I'd encourage everybody to take a look at it. It does uh, traditional things. It uses dime, uh, diplomatic. So you saw this past weekend pressure on China to stay out of the campaign, uh, energize the whole of government, not just our government and everybody, uh, Commerce, Treasury, Department of Energy, but our allies and partners in their governments. Informational, highlight all the bad things, war crimes. V. POTUS did that at the Munich Security Conference. On the military side, continue. We've gotten $100 billion of aid into Ukraine in various ways, shapes, or form. Continue that. Eradicate the old Soviet equipment that's in the, uh, the rest of the former Warsaw Pact. And somebody asked a question online about establishing headquarters. The bill calls for a multinational three-star headquarters in the Black Sea to control the maritime. I'm fully behind that. Lastly, economic. We can do a lot of things to mitigate the energy crisis, and we are, are the food security crisis. And uh, don't forget the Three Seas Initiative, one of the champion things that my friend Ian Brzezinski always brings up about the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Adriatic Sea, working together between those partners and allies to make the situation in the Black Sea uh, palatable. 
And we got to get ready for phase four reconstruction. There's been no discussion of that. In my humble opinion, it's a swag, I think, a trillion euros to rebuild Ukraine. We got to be talking about that right now, because sooner or later after this thing is over, and I hope it's sooner, there's going to be a donors conference. And we're going to have to fess up to the fact that we all have to put some money in. And that half of for $500 billion of Russian funds that's on hold around the world, take it and use it and give it to Ukraine for reconstruction. Thanks very much for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you. Thank you um, to all the three panelists um, for joining us today and to our participants. I'm sorry I didn't get all of your questions in. Aaron Race, um, Larry Haas, um, Kate Epstein, and many others. Um, I've tried to keep this as tight of a ship as I could, um, but over to you, um, Jeff Gedman, on behalf of American Purpose, thank you so much for, um, for hosting us. Um, and um, the last word um, is yours. So, Yulia, thank you. One thing that I heard from all three of our guests, and not for the first time, is when we're clear on our aims, we can become clear on our methods and allocation of resources. Thank you, and we will keep pushing. Ben, I want to remind you, and she was with you in Munich this last weekend, of the reply. It's consonant with what you put in chat the reply of the Finnish prime minister last year when she was asked by reporters, what's the off-ramp? And she said, the off-ramp is when all Russian forces leave Ukraine. That's the off-ramp. And she pivoted and walked away. In a word, thanks to everybody, all of you who participated, Admiral Generals, Dr. Zhosha, what a high quality, extremely helpful conversation. We're indebted, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Julia, for saying that you ran this ship uh, as a tight ship, especially with my Army and Air Force uh, colleagues. <laughs> in the there we go. Thank you so much, thanks, again everybody. To everyone. Bye. Bye.